first of all say that my name is, uh, my mama named me Patricia Catherine McCabe. And there's a really beautiful story about that, but it was actually named uh, for St. Patrick. So my namesake day was yesterday. <laughs> I noticed there wasn't a huge um, uh, St. Patrick Day celebration around here. It took me a minute to figure that one out. Uh, but, uh, there you go. <laughs> and, um, excuse me? Go to Kilden. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, you know, I puzzled over that name for a long time. And why would an indigenous woman be named after St. Patty? And uh, <laughs> I guess I'll just tell a very short story about my last name, because it's so powerful to me. <coughs> and to me, this is the consciousness shift that I hope for. So you know, in the United States in the mid-1800s, um, all of my people, I come from the Diné people, were um, being rounded up by the United States government. Um, any, any male member of my people who could lift a rifle or lift a gun had to turn themselves in or could be captured or worse. So, um, so my relative apparently um, was either, I don't know if he turned himself in or whether he was captured, but he was um, uh, being walked by the soldiers to one of the federal agencies. And <clears throat> as it turned out, um, there was an Irish soldier there with them. No doubt, um, trying to find maybe, I mean, I don't really know, but I imagine maybe he was trying to find uh, another life in the United States, right? And immediately, he was conscripted into the US military. And his very first job was to round up indigenous people in the United States. You can imagine. And so he, um, when they got to the federal agency office, the US government agency workers looked at my relative and said, look, we don't understand your name. We don't know how to spell it. It doesn't fit on our form. So we're going to give you another name. And, uh, and the Irish soldier said, look, if you can't, keep his own name, you know, because they had become friends on this walk. If he can't keep his own name, then let, let me give him mine. This makes me cry. <laughs> so I, I'm very proud to be Ms. McCabe today for that act of kindness, that act of generosity. I mean, what, what did he really have to give my relative? How could he really help my relative? And yet he gave him something so honorable and so beautiful and so powerful to give your surname to somebody else. So this is the shift in consciousness that I hope to, that we can all find together. Um, so I'll introduce myself as we do in our language. So I'll say to you, uh, so I'm telling you about my clans, and we get our clans from our, our mothers. Um, <coughs> so I say the ologists say that um, that we're a matrilineal people, and uh, I, that sounds suspiciously um, linear. <laughs> and. Uh, and a little bit boxed in, so I'm going to say we're probably something like that, and probably a little beyond it as well. Um, but a great deal is passed down through the women's side, including all of the land, property, and wealth. We were the, the wealth holders and keepers of the family and the people, traditionally. So very different, very different. And I don't know if you could feel that language, huh? But that's not Latin-based, friends. <laughs> So I don't actually speak a lot of my language because the other part of that history was um, after we'd been rounded up, uh, we were taken down to a concentration camp in the southern part of the state of New Mexico, which is the state I live in. I live in Taos, New Mexico. And in order to get out of that camp, we had to sign a treaty that said we would send our children to uh, uh, their schools. 
And um, so these schools were run by the churches and the government. <coughs> my family ended up in a Dutch Christian Reformed Missionary residential boarding school. And so my grandparents were there, and my parents were there. And uh, in that place, they were not allowed to practice our culture or speak our language. And so by the time I came along, um, no one was speaking the language around me, even though I had family members who knew it. And nobody was practicing our culture either. So what they, my, what my family knew to do was to put me in the highest educational institutes that they could <coughs> and say, you know, the, the best you can do is um, learn how to compete in this world. And I know people from all over the world, that's what their parents try to impart to them, out of love. It took me a long time to understand that was out of love. That was love. My parents wanted me to live and live well in some form or another after everything that they had experienced, right? So this was my setup. I think it's really important for you to understand who's talking to you, because here I am, a, an indigenous person from the United States, and you might have some romantic notions about me. And uh, thanks to Hollywood, and other things, uh, but I just I want I want you to know who's who is this person talking in front of you. So, <clears throat> so for me, the shift in consciousness that I my I, I myself have been in deep process of a shift in consciousness, and for a long time it was to just try to find a comfort in my own skin because I looked like this. And so people not of my culture would always say, hey, you're Native American, aren't you? What, how do your people do this? And how do they say that? And how do they, you know? So all these questions that, you know what? I couldn't answer. And then my own people, they would see me. They would recognize me. They recognize these, the level of these cheekbones. And they'd say, yeah, eh. This is kiss. And they'd start talking to me in that beautiful language. And you know what? I just let them talk for a while. <laughs> <laughs> because it's such a powerful language. Oh my gosh, that language. So powerful. And I love the sound of it. But at some point, you know, it was unethical to allow them to keep thinking that I knew what they were saying. Terrible moment, always. <laughs> and, uh, and have to say, I'm sorry, I don't understand you. And. Back in the day, when I was a youngster, um, the response oftentimes was, shame on you. Shame on you. Oof. And you know what? I really took that shame on, too. Oh my gosh. That's right. I'm supposed to know something that I don't. I'm supposed to be something that I don't know how to be. So <clears throat> I wish I could say that, you know, I just sat and meditated and decided on this path of a shift of consciousness, but that's not what happened. <clears throat> it, was, it was a desire to be comfortable in this skin. And that, that's taken some work. That's taken some work. <coughs> so, with that introduction, <laughs> I'm going to uh, sing a song here. And I'm going to call upon <coughs> the grandmother's the grandmother spirit calling song. And I, and I honor the uh, guardians of this land, like this, this block that we're on. <laughs> and uh, say thank you and ask your permission here to, to sing this song and know that I bring what my people hold and the, the place that I live on the earth and what she has taught me and my people there in support of what you would you would have your children know and understand and the way that you want to take care of them. And that's why I'm here. I'm not here to change your way with your, with your children over here. I'm not here to, um, to impose. I'm also not here to change the way that, that you give to me in, our, in the home that I have. But I want to come and support. And um, I also call upon the grandmother helpers that know me so well, so it's me, Wayakpa Najiwin, coming before you on this holy day. <coughs> 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 
Christian Reformed Church when I was 14, and I didn't know who I was sending my prayer out to, but I sent it out, and what came back were these people inviting me to a sweat lodge, and it was my first Native American ceremony that I had ever been to when I was 29 years old, and everything changed. <laughs> everything changed for me then. Um, the people who invited me to the ceremony were of European descent. They were not Native people. And that was not by accident, I'm certain. Um, because I needed to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the medicine is the medicine is the medicine is the medicine. And it can be with us and work with us and through us and bless us and hold us and care for us and evolve us and shine that light on us, no matter who we are. And so through that tradition, I was given a name, a spiritual name, Wiyakpa Najiwi. And the translation to English is, is something like Woman Stand Shining. So that's where that name comes from. I'm pretty shiny right now. <laughs> it's all right. Don't be alarmed. I'm not cool. I'm going to get used to it uh, <laughs> at this time of my life. But, um, but what I want to say to you this evening is um, hey, 
Heading into that ceremony um, allowed me to disengage from something that was really hurting me, hurting my soul, hurting my mind, hurting my body. And I didn't know what it was until much, much later. But as I stand here before you, what I can say is it helped me to disengage from a paradigm that is not moving towards life. And so, you know, much of what I speak uh, about, you know, and I say my greatest gift to the world is describing the journey that I've been taking from a paradigm of, <coughs> um, what's the word? So now we call this the, the, what is that, anthropomorphism? Anthropocene age, right? Um, so that self-centered age, <coughs> uh, and go back to a sacred hoop of life paradigm <laughs> in which every single form of life has an honored place on the sacred hoop, we say. And we say every single being on that hoop has a perfect design to uphold their part. And if everybody, that whole community, so flying ones, swimming ones, creepy crawling ones, four-legged ones, all the plants, I mean, uh, uh, the whole structure, the whole community, you know, if everybody enacts their perfect design, then we get to have thriving life here. And the thing is, is if you look out this window, I'm gonna have to look around a little bit in this neck of the woods, but, Everybody seems to know what to do out there in the natural world. And so I had to, I, the first question I had to ask myself is, do I think that somehow I was set here without a plan for, you know, a perfect design for thriving life as a human being? Like everybody else got the, got the blueprint and the perfect design except me being a human being? And my conclusion was, I don't think that could be. So what does that mean? That means that, that I, as a human being, also have a perfect design for thriving life. I've been saying lately, we, we have pretty low self-esteem as a species right now. <laughs> but that's why I include that, you know, what Christabel read in my introduction, you know. I'm here to uphold the honor of being human being. I'm here to reclaim the honor of being given that place on the sacred hoop. So you know what? I can say that and not even know fully what it means, but I know, I know that I, that compass point is true. So I invite you, if you like, it doesn't have to be right now and right here, but try that out. I am here to uphold the honor of being human being. Let's see where that heads, right? So, the paradigm, the paradigm of, that is not leading towards life, I say it's a power over paradigm. It's not a collaborative paradigm. It's not an interconnected paradigm. <coughs> It's not an interrelated paradigm. Well, I should say this. It kind of can't help but be connected to the interrelatedness, but as a structure and in its own goals, it tries very hard not to be. Because you, you really can't set up shop here on this Mother Earth and not be involved with the interrelatedness. As Thich Nhat Hanh says, we are an interbeing. We are an interbeing. What a word he gave us with that in English. There's lots of words like that in other languages, but in English, that's a great word, interbeing. And so we're such an interbeing that if we try to set up shop in a whole other direction, we end up affecting the whole interbeing, whether we want to or not. But in this, in this paradigm that we, we, are, we find ourselves in, um, that we're actually choosing, we're choosing this paradigm, my spirit helpers are adamant and they say to me all the time, you can have it any way you want it. You know that? 
You can have it any way you want it, and right now you're saying you want it like this. But you can have it any way you want it. And so in this paradigm of the power over paradigm, you know, what I see is that it, it's, it's, it, it is inherently competitive. I have to beat someone else out of what they need to live in order to have what I need to live. And so as science is, is sort of turning um, the first take on Newton's conclusions, you know, survival of the fittest, and now science is sort of turning that on its head and saying, well, actually, if you, if you look beyond this and look to this much of the story, we're actually going to find that it's survival of the cooperative and the collaborative. Mm -hmm. It's not survival of the fittest. How could it be as interbeing? And so we've been molded into this way of thinking. And one of the things that I talk about when I talk about sacred masculine and sacred feminine is it was what was told to me. They said, you, the, the, the spirit guide said to me, you think you know what masculine is and you think you know what feminine is, but you don't. All you know is how they behave when you plug them into a power over paradigm. But if you were to plug these same energetics into a different paradigm, you would have a completely different result. And so this is part of what I was finding as I went into that sweat lodge, as I was entering a paradigm in which those energetics were being held in a different way. In a way that, that could allow my body to, to unfurl, uncurl, and heal. And so I've also taken another step with that. I'm going to say, it's, it's, it, as human beings, we don't know who we are really, do we? All we know is who we are when we're plugged into this power over paradigm. <coughs> but who would we be in another paradigm? So, I don't know how many of you were watching the Kavanaugh hearings, um, the nomination of the Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh. Holy smokes. <laughs> I live in a lawless land, friends. And just watching the Kavanaugh hearings and watching you know, the, the, the women testify about this man's sexual assault behavior towards them, several women coming through, and it just, bouncing off, not being heard, not being acted on. It was, it was not a problem. Uh, and, and, and it really got me thinking, you know? And here's what it started, I started thinking about. I started thinking, like, wow, it just means nothing. And then there, there was this whole, you know, it brings up the whole, uh, you know, Me Too is arising, and there's a lot of, of talk about <clears throat> sexual assault, sexual abuse, and, and about consent. And so, you know, for a long time in the rape culture, I guess you could say we live in, um, you know, there, there is this idea, you know, one of, the, one of the questions that gets asked of a woman is, well, what were you wearing when that happened? Mm -hmm. But it's an important question in a way, because it's saying, by what you were wearing, were you giving consent? Right? And so I was thinking about that. So I was thinking in the Kavanaugh hearings about the women, and I said, how can a woman really give consent in this life? The, the, the law doesn't recognize her. The, the health system doesn't recognize her needs. Her reproductive rights are not her own. Um, her economics are, are rigged. Her earning capacity is, is not the same as her male counterparts. We have the glass ceiling. If she is going to move up in this power over paradigm, she pretty much has to stop acting like female. And so how, in that system, how can a woman actually give consent? Isn't at some level, isn't there some place in her saying, gosh, I better play ball here? or I might not have food, clothing, and shelter. But then I may also begin to think, well, what about indigenous people? Isn't that the same for them? 
And then I began to think a little further. Isn't that just people of color? Isn't that people who don't participate in binary gender system? And it just kept going. <laughs> Until I realized, you know, as we talk about, you know, all the fruits of the labor traveling up this, this, this pyramid, I always have it as a structure, to the 1%. Isn't that the story of 99% then? And for that matter, the flying ones, swimming ones, creepy crawling ones, four-legged ones? Because where I come from, they, we say they, they have to give consent. We say the human beings, the five-fingered ones, were the last ones to arrive here. And so those, all of those ones are our elders. And they're all doing their best to try to get us schooled into understanding how you live here and have thriving life. They're our elders. We have to have their consent, right? So, so I began to think about this. And I began to think that, you know, one of the structures that I feel that I understand is one of the um, laws of this structure that we're living in is the law of free will. So the law of free will says you get to have a choice. You get to choose what you want to do. And it kind of seems right now like you can pretty much do whatever this noodle can dream up. Because we're doing it. We don't, need, we don't have to know where the story ends. If we got a good idea, and now it's coupled with, if you got a good idea and it's gonna make you some money, you get to go for it. We're now paying science to come up with the results we want so that we can do what we wanna do, rather than seeing what the science is telling us. So in that case of we get to do whatever we wanna do, I'm noticing, but there seems to be a caveat to that, which is, you get to do whatever you can dream up that you want to do, but you might not also be able to have life on this planet. And believe it or not, that's like a, <coughs> gosh, I don't know, that's a tough choice. <laughs> like that's where we're at right now. That's where we're at. It's rough, you know? But that's kind of where we're at right now, right? And so I was thinking about that. But the other part of free will is what I was just describing that my elders <coughs> talked about, which is to say that every being has sovereignty. Every being has sovereignty. The ants, the platypus, the amoeba, everybody has sovereignty. And we have to treat them as a sovereign being. We, we, are, not, we are not allowed to just stomp on their trajectory, where they're headed, how they are needing to move to enact their perfect design for thriving life, right? And so here's where the consent piece comes in that has really got me going. That is to say that what would happen if this is a spiritual law that governs this place, what would happen if we were to fully reclaim our consent? Because think about it. Give my consent when I was born to be registered with the United States government and to be given a number that said, I will be your collateral, which in which you can take tax me for the, all of my life to do what you want to do with that money. Did I really give that consent upon my birth? Did I give my consent to, you know, did my did I give my consent when they told my mom, look, you know, if you really love your kid, you'll give them I guess here they call it the jab, uh, with these chemicals to make sure they don't get a disease that you would not want to watch them have. Did I consent to that? No. Did I consent to um, uh, a 40 hour work week? You know, so when I really start thinking about all the places of consent that are assumed, it just goes out and out and out and out. We were born into a paradigm, not understanding that paradigm is a choice. And our consent narrative inside, I believe, as I look around, goes something like, 
Well, I had to consent to having a social security number. I had to consent to um, eating this food that has pesticides all over it. I had to consent to um, this money system. I had, you know, and so what I want to point out to us is if you are have under, the, under the feeling of I had to, cons had to give consent to, you didn't actually give consent. And so I have this tickling feeling that this is a very, very important piece because we have been talked out of, because we've been so talked into material science to intellectual logic, we've been led out of the laws that govern this place. We've been led away from the spiritual laws that govern this place. But they are here. They are here. And that's something that I've been learning ever since I went into that sweat lodge. Many indigenous peoples call them the original instructions, right? And so I want to experiment with all of you and say, what happens if we were to say, I do not consent to this Mother Earth being taken from me I do not give my consent to this life being taken from us. So then I think, what would I be giving my consent to? What's the highest that I could give my consent to? So, what I come up with when I think about that is I'm thinking that, you know, even though we have free will and we pretty much get to do everything this needle, noodle gets to think up, there does seem to be governing principles and laws in place that say, and yet you can wreck this thriving life for the whole interbeing, right? So that must mean that she has her way. That's my conclusion. She has her way. And in fact, as I travel, indigenous peoples all over the world have been saying this. She has her way. We get to live by her way. And so, you know, sometimes when I have these, these conversations, I'll say, it's not that indigenous people weren't intelligent enough to come up with a nuclear weapon. It's not because we didn't have the smarts. It's because we had been taught that there are ways to be here that will keep life moving in a good way, and we need to follow those. And that would not lead us and all the intelligence and all the creativity that we had in the direction of building a nuclear weapon. So, I'm going to say that this Mother Earth is the highest authority in the land. It's her way or no way. <laughs> if Mama ain't happy, ain't nobody going to be happy, as the saying goes. It's her law. She's the authority here. We're not on Pluto. We're not on Mars. Yet, I say bon voyage. I'll stay here. But, you know, this, this is... <laughs> She's it. And I, and I hold a spiritual being that I call creator. And I feel like creator's will, spirit's will, is interpreted for me as a flesh and blood human being through her. She's, if I'm going to have a priest, it's going to be a priestess, and it's going to be her to interpret that spiritual law for me. And so my consent right now, here's the other thing that I've been saying to myself every day. I forgot to say it today, so I'll be saying it now. And I say, I give my consent only to the authority of the law of the heart of Mother Earth. 
I give my consent only to the authority of the law of the heart of Mother Earth. Close your eyes for a second, see how that feels. I give my consent only to the law of the heart of Mother Earth. So, I don't know what that means, and I don't have to know what that means yet. I know that my compass is pointed true again, and, and if I keep repeating that to myself, I'm going to learn how to retrieve all the consent that I didn't even know I had. What a spiritual gift that was, that I have, to, I have to consent, give consent to things. What a spiritual gift that was. And it's been completely obscured and hidden from our view in the power over paradigm. But I know if I keep saying that, I'm going to learn how to retrieve that consent. And one last thing I'll say, I'm guessing my time must be coming to a close here. Um, is that one thing I notice as, and I think we can really use that example of consent, uh, consensual uh, sexual relations. We can use a lot, we can really look at that and, and learn a lot about this consent. Um, but what I notice is it seems that this consent that I'm seeking like to reclaim one bit of consent, I might have to retrieve it out of law, out of health, out of social structure. So one consent, so to speak, can be fragmented into several different places. And that's what's confusing about it. But I can, I can, I can learn how to see where is it, where are all the pieces of my consent? So I just wonder what would happen if all the five-fingered ones were to say together, I do not consent to my life being taken. Even if we think, well, I could say that, but they're just going to keep doing it. They're just going to keep doing it, so what's the point? No, there is a point. We would be engaging spiritual law. We would be engaging spiritual law. And there are consequences for violating spiritual law. When, where, and how that will come due, I can't say. But I'm going to say, at the very least, I'm going to make those who would not honor my consent cross that spiritual line and deal with the spiritual consequences. That much I can do from where I sit, anywhere, anytime. So, come experiment with me. Mm -hmm.